authors at Google New York is very excited to have a selection of poets from the new book, The Best New Poets of 2012. It is my personal pleasure to introduce our first poet today. Daniel Meltz is a Googler and is on my team, and I'm pleased as punch that we are here and uh, talking about uh, some of the stuff he likes to do when he's not doing the stuff that he does. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, Danny Meltz. Thank you, uh, and thanks, Kate, for uh, arranging all this. I'm gonna introduce the first poet. We're gonna go in alphabetical order. So the first poet uh, is Elizabeth T. Gray, Jr. She's a poet, translator, and corporate consultant. Her translations of Iran's major mystical poet, Hafiz E. Shirazi, died in 1389, were published by White Cloud Press in 1995. Poems and translations from Persian and Tibetan have appeared or are forthcoming in the Kenyan Review, the Lloyd Poetry Journal, the Harvard Review, the Cimarron Review, Poetry International, Plowshares, Agni, the New Orleans, Review, the New Haven Review, Mantis, and Province 10 Arts. She has a JD from Harvard Law School and an MFA from War Warren Wilson College. She lives in New York City, and she's at ElizabethGrayJr.com. Elizabeth T. Gray. Thank you. And thank you all, all for having us and sharing your lunch with us. It's been really fun to meet the other poets in the anthology. And I'm just really pleased to be here today. Um, I'm going to start with one of the poems that's in the anthology. It's called Albania. I grew up at the height of the Cold War in the 50s and the 60s. And of all the communist countries, Albania was the most mysterious. I mean, you just couldn't find out anything about it. It wasn't on you know, the hit list of evil countries. But my first passport said, you know, if you take this passport into Albania, it will become invalid. Um, so time passed, fast forward. In the year 2005, my husband and I were on a boat homeschooling our kids in the Mediterranean. And um, as we were going up the west coast of Greece, I looked at the charts and there was Albania. So this was written after we'd left. We were heading up the coast to Croatia. Albania. On Sunday, I went to Albania. No one understood, clearly at first, why I or anyone would go to Albania, except my father, who knew at once. Because before, you couldn't go to Albania. It had never occurred to me before to actually go to Albania. For years, it was there, a Mars, the ultimate hole in the atlas, Albania. Our government said you couldn't go to Albania. Passports self-vaporized, I thought, if you went to Albania. It's like the missiles, the Middle Ages with missiles over there in Albania. And sometimes China, Albania. But then it was Sunday, 40 years later, and I was right there. I was right next to Albania. There's a thin strait and small islands. You pay a ferryman to cross to Albania. Before, people who tried to swim away were shot by men in trenches and towers guarding Albania. Everyone was surprised when I left alone for Albania. Given her history, were you worried when your mother went off to Albania? No, well, maybe a little, they said. She'd never mentioned Albania. When I came back, everybody asked about Albania. They said, what did you see in Albania? I began to reply, but that was enough of Albania. Perhaps it was hard for them, the idea of Albania. Maybe they never had an Albania. They weren't panicked. They didn't ask, what will we do now that you can go to Albania? It's been a few days now it's as if nothing happened, as if I never went to Albania. The chart shows two ports and several small harbors, but from this far offshore, there are no lights anywhere along the coast of Albania. And as we move north, somewhere to starboard, steep and with snow, is Albania. 
I'm also thrilled that this poem is actually about to be translated into Albanian <laughs> by, by my new friend, Ukulushi, uh, who read the poem. And now I've been introduced to all this Albanian literature and Albanians and New York is full and Facebook is full of all these Albanians. And it's, it's just an astonishing introduction to a country that I never thought actually existed. Um, I'm a translator of classical Persian poetry and studied in Iran and Afghanistan and Pakistan, mostly in the 70s, some in the 80s. So I'm going to, the next poem moves east a little in terms of geography. In my, uh, on my first trip east, hitchhiking from Istanbul to Kathmandu, um, I traveled for the first time across that geography with my first devastating true love. And this poem is a poem written to him later, obviously, um, that speaks directly to him but draws on a tradition in Islamic poetry, which we really don't have. It's uh, using uh, poems as pre-battle jihadist exhortations or curses against the enemy. And some of the lines, I confess, are stolen. They were stolen from a document that was posted uh, on an Al-Qaeda website in 2005 called An Ultimatum to the Shiites and Crusaders by Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, who was running Al-Qaeda in Iraq at the time. So it's called In the Alleyway of the Beloved, and it starts with a verse from the Quran. Here's the Quranic surah. Whatever vow you vow, surely Allah knows it and the evildoers will have no help. It was no dream back then, in the high cold between the mountains, at the rim of the gravel pits west of the city, watching the dogfights, the men with whips taking bets, where we swore to it, and again later we swore to it, where the money changer's boy brought us tea on a copper tray. I kept faith, kept to faint goat tracks in snow, became both wraith and arrow, embedded a blade end in your rib. You remember there in your broad California how dust hangs like breath or gold in the air here, in the land of the two rivers. In this maze of narrow lanes, there will be no mercy. That word in my throat has been slit. You will be given to drink from the various goblets of death. It is written, he who warns is excused. Moving from that cheerful note, um, it took me 30 years to write that. I, I hope someday he gets to read it. Um, the last poem's from a manuscript that is forthcoming from Four Way Books, uh, where Victoria, our next reader, uh, works. It's going to be published in the spring of 2015. It's a series of poems uh, loosely based on the adventures of a bunch of young travelers and hippies. Uh, who are traveling through India. And in this one, Blake, who's a Brit, um, is sharing with a group of his friends, uh, one of whom's name is Sarah, um, a way cool, new, tantric, strange, bizarre, visualization and meditation technique that he's heard about. Blake was talking up a new rite you go alone to a really scary place, spread out your skin, cook your body parts up in your iron pot, add specific syllables, summon the demons, feed them, and you're free. You have to get it just right, so he went over the invitees and ingredients again, dandling lung, aorta, liver, femur, diphthong, Brad said nothing, but Nadia offered the room a few more inches of arm. 
I never have to call them, said Sarah. Two of them are always there. An opaque, imperceptibly moving surface that stretches away on every side. And betrayal for which there is no evidence, but of which I am entirely certain. Doesn't love dismember ourselves? Every curve and secretion offered up? Afterward, you pick up your skin and go home. Thank you. <laughs> Let me introduce Victoria. Victoria Lynn McCoy holds an MFA in poetry from Sarah Lawrence College. Her works appeared in Boxcar Poetry Review, Used Furniture Review, Pank, and Union Station Magazine, among others. A member of the Louder Arts product, Project, Victoria lives in Brooklyn and works for Four Way Books. Welcome, Victoria. Hi, thanks Kate for setting this all up and having us and thank you for sharing your lunch hour with us. Um, I'll start by reading the poem from the anthology. Self-Portrait in Unfinished Letters. Dear, the gulf is bleeding black again. They say they'll fix it. They say Claude Chabral is dead for the first time today. September 12th and church bells through the courtyard window. I meant to see more of his films while he was alive. Barreling down Pacific Coast Highway, what was that song? Do you remember what Allison sounds like sitting shotgun? Dear, I quit vegetarianism last month. Remember when the teacher said, I'm too old to protest. The largest picture on the front page of the paper is a man crossing Bryant Park with a mannequin under arm. They said they'd fix it. A city of moths to the tent white sheen of celebrity. I try to leave her out of this one. Allison, a choir of whispers in the dark. Dear, they decided not to burn the Quran yesterday. You've always liked it better when there's a they in the story. I've lost faith in my own impact. The Nile is drowning in 100 tons of gasoline and Allison is dead for the 1717th time when I wake. There's a fire under the earth they can't fix. Dear, La fille coupée en deux in a near empty theater. My appendage is haunted with so many almosts. I've forgotten her face for the third time today. A sunken in man on the subway sings about a city built entirely of instruments that make no sound. The train doors open their ghost bright mouths, a calling. I'll go anywhere, the sirens can't find me. Uh, this next poem is borrowed from um, a Japanese form called the Zuihitsu. That's a sort of collage-like um, poem of fragments, and it means the moving brush. Um, so it's after Kimiko Han, the body breakable. I watch the lifeguards clasp hands. A human rake, wade into the whitewash for the body of a girl who never surfaced. Somewhere an ocean is unbroken by rain. My limbs furious with sleep, now the night is beginning to secede from Brooklyn. The line that has haunted me. You ought to wake up with your mouth full of pity. I am constantly falling in love with the impossibility of a thing. Again, the knee splits open. Autumn is one long lesson in what makes the body breakable. Some nights there is a cliff, others a slight mattress shift under some invisible weight at my back. 
A siren croons its lullaby from the sea of passing headlights. Her name has erected a glass cathedral around me. Reading again today about how Zeus once split the humans in half. Ruined cities are we defined by what is missing. <clears throat> And this next poem is called Obad in Pieces. Even as I deliver my body from the subway's tenebrous mercy, I cannot unknow this. Each time daylight invades our limbs, the sun marching its restless armies up the sheets, my love will put entire states between us and there's no telling when the map will tesseract itself to bring him back. Always his breath that first breaks me, his chest a hum of lightning bugs, lethal little darlings. His fingers swarm my thighs, he leaves teeth prints to miss him by. Praise this skin, its miracle cells, their blessed forgetfulness. Under my pillow, a mason jar, where I collect my name each time it burns his mouth open. Fireflies in the summer porch of him, I pin their wings down. I sing to them of the hour before the wolf comes. <clears throat> Still life with geese in the water. On the border between Pennsylvania and New Jersey, the geese gather behind the bridge's concrete legs to keep from carrying away with the current. The river, lightsome and long, and the horizon a great mouth calling. I recognize the voice. I am not afraid to be dead, only of the act of dying. My favorite first date was a surprise helicopter ride, an aerial tour of Long Beach Harbor, which I'd known from the ground all my life. I've always loved heights. I think I'd enjoy the falling before the body breaks. I left the small bird contorted on the grass, soft landing place below the window it tried to fly through when it tired of all that possible sky. I'd like to know what's on the other side. I scrounge in my purse for the pills to stop the jackhammer behind my eyes. I think my sight is failing. The stoplights have all grown coronas and the time blurs in its black box. A cyst blooms between my wrist bones like a promise. This body will someday forego me completely the metacarpals parting in my hand when I write, a sharp piercing up my arm that might be mercy. Um, and this is my last poem. Again, thank you all for being here. Self-portrait as Odysseus. If there is wreck in me, let it be anchor and all. Oh, you beautiful ones with your jackal call, the steel trap of you and your meadow starred with flowers. You honey-throated ghosts, ripples in the windless hours. My dead are waiting at the bottom. Sing the bees free of me that I may listen. Sing the wound clean out of the skin. I come to you lying down in my petal-thin excuses. You already know my name. Sing me soft boned, sing me home, you with the map of the unknown carved in your palms, untie me from grief's tall mast. See how it's made a gully of me, oh you gods of relief, let the water in. And our next poet will be Daniel Meltz. Daniel Meltz is a technical writer at Google. As a younger man, he taught geometry to the deaf and word perfect to the blind. He lives in Midtown Manhattan between a beauty parlor and a nail salon. 
His work has been published in American Poetry Review, Upstreet, Mudfish, Audio Zone, Assisi, Temenos, 40 Ounce Bachelors, and Cross Connect. Please welcome Daniel Meltz. Thank you, thanks for coming. Um, okay, this, this, this first poem is from, from the anthology. It's called Intrinsic Marimbos. <laughs> I had 45 minutes, so I went to my favorite shoelace store on East 59th, where the shoelace boy is always flirting with the hot cashier in her skin-tight top. They're appealing, although they don't exactly take me in. And then it's out into the street again, where nobody's sure if it's drizzling enough to haul out the umbrella. The crowds are staggering. The tourists in the glass apple elevator, the arm-in-arm -arm Brazilians, the jaywalking bullies, the women in flip-flops, toes serenely gripping. The man and woman in gorgeous sweaters and matching tans emerging from Bergdorf's, door held, two big doormen with creased smiles and no sense of pomp. I was here a couple months ago at Doug's suggestion. It was drizzling then, too. He loves that little shoelace store where they also do shines and repairs, of course. He was always saying, of course, which I hated at first. It seemed so condescending. But then I came to understand his odd expressions of delight. I do not miss him, but I miss the way he showed up jumping and took off bouncing and looked at me as if we were jackhammering sidewalk, worker and foreman deep into sex. But the crowds were exciting, the drama of the crisscross, and then a walk through Crate and Barrel. I bought a pillow, black and green. Two men helped me, one large, one small, both Filipino a double-barreled cruise that only added to the jolt of the purchase. They put my pillow in a see-through bag, which made me a little embarrassed. I thought, let me take 58th back west to get away from the people, but after a block I was bored. I wanted to see the trees, so I circled around and into the park where everything was shockingly green from all the rain of this week, and the barks were black, greens and blacks, as exciting as the black and green of the pillow I'd bought. The lindens and flowers smelling like juicy fruit, soil sopping, mossy, quiet. The dark pain of quiet so close to all the traffic. An awesome chart with spandrel branches and stained glass leaves and fog in the, in the spandrels. The fog's been settled in among the building tops for days, so unusual in Midtown. You can't see the top of Time Warner. It disappears into the fog along with the top of the ugliest trump in the world and the memory of a boat ride in the snow. Later, there he was, Doug, in front of CBS, whispering my name before he slipped inside. So this next one, I'm not really used to reading poetry in public. <laughs> <laughs> this one is called uh, on a Murphy bed mattress full of Easter eggs drawer. I would write and the lines would spool out of me. It was a physical need to keep defining myself, but I never felt defined. I filled notebooks, I covered walls, I hung a pen around my neck. That was the strangest, the pen around my neck. I counted out the beats of the words on my fingers. I broke the thesaurus, I consulted the forms. Pyramids, houses, concertos, pup tents, anything to give a shape to my thoughts that ran screaming from the feelings my thoughts turned up in rampages of anxiety and unbroken hours of unconsidered scribble. When I had no money, I scotch taped notebooks together and wrote poems and plays and serial comic novels starting from the back next to the inside cover that in a store bought version would show a multiplication table. When I had a little money, I bought a computer. When I had a little more, I started watching TV. It was while channel surfing that I saw it all clearly. In the crooked smile of an anime warrior, in Anne Bancroft's persistent finger spelling, in the pitiless debating of the whiners and the chest beaters, on the faces of the chubby kids turning cartwheels on the Disney Channel, in the AIDS reports, in Mike Wallace's wrinkles, in Barbara Streisand's tears, in the squalor after the flood, in the hubris after the landslide, in a softened Archie Bunker, in a confrontational Edith, in the wind in the trees. I saw it. I took a picture of it with my cell phone camera. Mike's face morphing into Barbara's, God's feet slipping into a sinister pair of slingback energetics. It's in the line, see. The lines that differentiate the heads from the curtains, the ankles from the pantyhose, the other from the me. 
This, this next poem is, uh, is called Just Outside of Bowler City. And when I was a kid, uh, there was a, a bowling alley in Hackensack, New Jersey that claimed to have the most alleys in the planet. So it had 50 bowling alleys. So 50 lanes, I mean, just outside of Bowler City. My first teacher was my father, a sarcastic figure in underpants. He taught me how to idolize and instigate. My mother ran from him. She brushed her hair till it bounced. She used the hairbrush as a weapon. She loved the smell of the future, but she never stepped into it. My sister showed me her workbook, a multiplication table and spelling lists. She read Black Beauty aloud to me. She turned on cartoons, Heckle and, Je Heckle and Jekyll, Two Angry Crows. She told me about her teachers at school, the teacher with the swinging can, the teacher with the blubbery neck, the one with the swishing stockings, the one with the tangerine lipstick. We shared a bedroom with a kidnap window. We stage whispered at daybreak, biting the cream out of cookies. We broke bobby pins in two and scratched every inch of a crap credenza. Uh, I'm going to read two more. This one's called Nine Lives. <laughs> it's years since I've had an answering machine, but there are still many nights I turn the key in the lock, eager to play whatever messages were left while I was working. At times, I still think the radio, radio will go off when I turn out the bathroom light, though it's even more years since that was how it functioned. These are memories like dreams from a previous life that flicker in an updraft of mylar confetti at the back of the hero waving from his Jeep. We forget how much we've changed, but the diarists and the face blind know. It's hard for them to remember and recount their humiliations on yellowing paper and in the offended glares of the forgotten. Okay, this last one uh, is called Narcoleptic Karaoke. You know, some of these I have expurgated because coworkers are here, so this, uh, yeah. <laughs> there are some things, Greg, I just could not read to, you know, I don't know. But I, just a couple of words, just a couple of words. But anyway, this is Narcoleptic <laughs> Karaoke. I used to make lists of the names of my friends, John, Larry, Ernest, Jeffrey, Rick, Gene, Steve, Lee. Then every couple of days I'd rewrite the list on a scrap of paper or on a blank page in my diary. Over time, the list would change. John, Larry, Jeffrey, Mitch, Jean, Lee, Ellen, Bill. Sometimes the list was lined up with my groceries. Mitch, coffee, John, yogurt, David, shredded wheat, Jeffrey, tomato juice. Or lined up with my groceries and the movies I'd seen. Tom, wheat germ, a room with a view. Larry, chickpeas, tuna, blue velvet. I used to write down everything we talked about in therapy. You're full of murderous rage. I can't hear you. Then I burst into tears. She's right, she's right. As much verbatim as I could remember. A one-act play three times a week. I wrote down everything I saw and who I went with. I re recorded record highs and lows and the names of the trees and every penny I spent. I recorded orgasms, sick days, days I'd smoked pot, the length of the movie, the number of hours since I'd last seen Howie, since I'd first met Linwood, since recorded rain had fallen. Inches of snow, days above 90, the 10 most populist, populist the driest, the loneliness, loneliest, the lone list, the one list, the on list, the off list. Eventually, I threw them out. Eventually, you wake up startled. What are you keeping lists for? What's with all the ledger domain? It wasn't a question of what to remember, the diving birds told me, but who to forget. That's it. So our next reader is Ben Perkert. His poems have recently appeared or are forthcoming in The New Yorker, Fence, Denver Qu Quarterly, The All Diagram, New Orleans Review, uh, Carolina Quarterly, Spoon River <coughs> Poetry Review, and elsewhere. He holds an MFA from NYU and is currently completing his first poetry manuscript, One Good. He is also poetry editor of Bodega at bodegamag.com. Please welcome Ben Perkert. Thank you, Dan. These poems will be completely uncensored, so just really. <laughs> um, thank you, Google, so much. Uh, thank you to all of you for making time uh, for poetry in your busy day. 
Um, thanks also to the University of Virginia Press who put this anthology together. Um, it's beautiful, the work is really great. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm appreciative to them too. I'm gonna read a few uh, shorter poems. <clears throat> this is uh, the one that appears in the anthology. It's called Ode to Stretch Armstrong. Didn't you ever fling him across the mudroom? All these rules around a body, how far it can or cannot. Stretch could land hard and never look, so to speak, thrown. Like a pronoun, he'd leap rivers to attach to something else. Don't you lose him in the heat vents by the door. Somewhere you can bet more of stretches being made. Every moment on the assembly line is itself assemblage, hands gluing on the legs, or virtually no hands at all, only the sun, which is also a machine. Once a boy scout on your block had eight gold screws inserted in his shin. Once on TV, a chopper flew so low to the earth, it missed it entirely. U-Haul and the Dream of Arrows. A little pink lemonade in the nick of my thumb, a little radio static ringing in my lungs, and each lung works like a cutout, since the body can't be everywhere, can't be all things to all mirrors, and with my windows down, I'll pretend this isn't a U-Haul, but a huge ass space bot bearing me in its gaping mouth. And the two of us could toss around ideas for miles. We could blow by a million signs lit up, high in the sky with arrows pointing down. And I think maybe that's what sky is, just a whole mess of incredibly sharp ends. And the U-Haul has something he needs to say. He nearly breaks down from not saying it. Uh, decided to read this next poem. It felt sort of topical with the Super Bowl coming up. Um, I read sort of this horrifying statistic. America consumes more than a billion chicken wings on the day of the Super Bowl. Uh, more than a billion. Um, I have my order. Yeah, it's uh, sort of staggering. Title of this poem, Very Nearly a Billion Wings. This Rose Bowl America will polish off nearly a billion wings alone. Let's start looking at each wing as one half of a couple in a movie theater, or instead, a dent in the gross figure of what we can count on one hand. A bird less its wings has a span around five seconds left. Then the big game unravels. One fumble too many. Loudly, a fan on his bar stool might snap. Why are they cutting to the mascot? How hard is it to film the damn field? Uh, just three more poems. Uh, so I work um, in advertising, branding. Um, I freelance for a few different agencies, so a lot of my work um, involves uh, themes relative to consumerism and how we sort of process ads and um, you know the relationship to the mind. So this is a poem that sort of uh, is interested in that territory. Shown an image of an M&M wrapper, a subject salivates. The mind is so easily had. It's easily the first picked off deer from a herd the one the herd guessed would go first, but never said anything. And they let the mind be ravaged. This way they might stand a chance. And it was so freeing to look on with no mind. The parts being eaten in sequence, the jaws closing on the very slim bones of the mind. And when the herd left to roam, they fell sideways, their mouths Oh, so close in the grass. Um, 
feel I, I don't know what what this means or, or, or if this is only me, but I feel like I've been seeing a ton of people um, that have butterfly tattoos, like not just like recently, but just sort of like throughout the course of my life. It's been sort of this like really um, quiet trope. I don't know. Um, so I, I was interested in that. And then I decided instead of sort of a, a person with a tattoo of a butterfly, what about a um, butterfly with a tattoo of a person? And that sort of um, bloomed into whatever this is. Tattoo on a butterfly of a woman. The TV's so loud I start squinting. I start at the corner of each eye, pinching it in barely enough to ruffle a bedsheet with visible force. The TV booms, what's coming up next? And this is distinct from the future. I think the future's a tough skin we always chew. We even leave some very light marks on it. Once on a date, a butterfly lifted her wings to me. She was revealing some pattern. Uh, and this is the last poem. Thanks again. Love like a fork and knife. For weeks, rain bruises the backyard where one tree shines as a proxy for standing upright. But a tree can't separate twigs from leaves let alone clouds from passing planes. And maybe it's both male and female, so each can't split from the other, each half rooted in something hard. And the tree is no billboard, but still flashes like one white hot bulb soaking up the electric, and says to whoever's around, there's water where I am. Also, some sun here. It's possible to say things simply by not dying. Thank you very much. And the next and last and very talented poet we have is Sophia Starma. She, grad she received an MA in French and, Franco and Francophone literature from Bryn Mawr College and is currently completing an MFA in poetry at Sarah Lawrence. She works as a writing teacher and tutor in New York City. Sophia. Thanks so much. I'm really excited that I finished that MFA since this book was published. Yeah. No, it's really important. You can finish things. Yeah. Thanks so much. It's really special to be here. The poem in the book is from a long poem that I wrote, which is sort of a love story that I wrote for myself and also for the place where I grew up, which is um, in Western New York, a really small village. So I'm going to start there and just keep going and read you a bit from that very long poem. If I too, thinks Alice, then the glacier. In the beginning, grinding its fingers, the grit of schist and granite sticks to its lonely bone, its white soul to steer it, a whalebone whistling north. If the glacier thinks Alice, then I. If I, then the ice. If I, too, then the mouth of the river, the mouths of the dead through my dream. If I, too, then the rock and the names carved in the rock. If I, too, then my mother her fringed leather jacket. If I too, then the calf and the cows hanging udder. If I too, then the field, each wheat spear turning. If I too, then the song under the light shaft striking. If I too, then each blade of sun unturning and the darkness and the darkness hollering over the valley and after 10 millennia, even a glacier gives up the ghost. I had forgotten they still made places, thinks Joe, like this. When the hot sun slams back in, her eyelids, the ripe darkness, the drugstore softens around her. What is a drugstore after all, remembers Joe. Something about sweet syrup and chipped ice, something about penny candy, thinks Joe, asking, 
the pimpled boy behind the counter for a soda, the sly ceiling fan unwinding, dust from hot September, I'll take it, she says, and pays for a cherry Coke. Cherry Coke, please, says Alice in her sundress, sitting on the concrete stoop, Alice in her feathered down, furs like a blonde coat, Alice on the edge of becoming Alice, drinks like a greedy wolf from the waxy paper cup, leaves sweet sweat on the rim. It's only the strap of a sundress in hot September the poured cement of an old-time drugstore, the strap of a sundress, a sun-peeled shoulder. Shouldn't you be, asks Joe, in school? But Alice holds her eye, says nothing. They sip at cherry Cokes and suck. The ice, the wax, flakes on the cup, the skin, peels on the shoulder. I have become a woman, writes Alice in her notebook, but before disappearing through the greening lighted slips, just the strap of her sundress, her peeled skin shoulder and Joe, without thinking, pulls it up. With the radio down and the windows at one with her thoughts, Joe's got seven women on her mind. Seven women like seven stars, one for each finger of her left hand, and two for the invisible fingers of feeling. One the stories she reaches out for, two the stories reaching back, seven women, Seven stars, seven sisters, tucked in Orion's belt. Joe knows Orion, knows his heavy shield, buckles against the night, knows the heavy arms of his terror, knows the little knife he keeps tucked close. Which is more illicit, a not so little girl in the streetlight or the driver home from a guilty errand? Alice owns the street, tuned to the night machine, a car shining, approaching, holding her ground in the one lane street, the thrill in her t-shirt, the dew in the crickets, Alice, no summer is dying, and Alice wants to be real in the headlight, wants to be touched, under her dress by flakes of light that beam, from the headlights holds the unknown gaze of the stranger, late from work, or something worse, they both know the needle of nighttime. Alice spreads herself on the darkness and bounds into the arms of the ash tree. The car slows and scuttles by. They have seen, not seen, each other. For everyone knows, this town goes to bed at nine. Back home, the driver considers the moon, its horns and its feathers, the orange disc of its suffering, down the hill he steers his lonely station wagon. This is the weight of one. He slides his feet, his leather clogs and hand-knit socks, his graying beard, his weakness, slumps at the table, leaves the light untouched upstairs, his wife breathing, the children sticky with dreams. He has a taste at once of frost, October coming, the moon dropped pebbles, of ice and trouble. The driver watched them glitter off the skin of the girl made real in his headlight. Hands strong and sullen, he cradles his head, alone in the darkness, alone in the breathing and winter to come. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone.